Okay, good evening. Um, sorry, I'm a little late starting. Um, I meant to start a little earlier. Um, obviously, we're all in a different place than we want to be. And um, the world is upside down. The world is uh, not what we know how to navigate through. It's a world that has changed. And um, I guess there's a lot of reflection that we're doing and trying to get through and trying to understand what to do and how to be. And um, I, uh, I suppose I'd like to, I really want to dedicate this learning to um, the healing of all the sick people and to the suffering that we're all on some level going through. I think the whole world is uh, obviously interconnected in such a way that we're feeling our own pain and we're feeling the pain of so many other people that we know and that we don't know, understanding that it's a very scary time and that we're really out of control. And as a believing person, I do believe that God's in control. And um, one of the things that we can continue to do in the face of so much uncertainty and so much not knowing and um, not being able to have um, an agency necessarily, even though we're trying very hard, <laughs> one of the things we can continue to do is to learn Torah and to um, continue to try to understand a little bit from our human perspective of what the teachings are that God is trying to convey to us through the Holy Torah that was given to us at Mount Sinai. So as I've been teaching these classes already for now a couple of years, we continue, I want to continue with the consistency, I hope, of um, trying to glean wisdom from the Torah, from the five books of Moses and the uh, weekly readings that obviously have been interrupted now because they're not being read in the synagogue, which are public readings. And we're not reading the, the, the Torah in the synagogues now because all the synagogues are closed. And uh, just sidebar comment that that is what God wants of us. He wants us to be inside our homes. He wants us to not go to, no, go to synagogue and not listen to the Torah. We have to read it for ourselves. We have to redefine um, our religious lives and how, and how they have maybe been more public and now they're going to be much more private. Our prayer services are private. We're, we're not praying in Minyanim. We're not praying in synagogues. We're praying at home and we're praying in the streets when we take our walks. Hopefully some of us are still taking walks and um, asking for wisdom and asking for clarity and asking for healing and asking for this to end and for us to be able to learn the lessons that we need to learn so we can be on the other side of this. Um, I do believe from what I've read and what I've heard um, that this is um, a very, very big deal. This is a megafa, it's a plague coming from the higher worlds as an idea that anything that happens in this world is a reflection of something that's going on in the upper worlds. The upper worlds, what happens down here is a reflection of what's happening in the upper worlds. Um, I listened to a class about the notion of Geula, the, the notion of there being a redemption. Here we are coming up to Passover with the uh, the whole teaching of redemption. So in order to be redeemed, we have to be coming out of a of an Egypt, coming out of a, a place of constraints, coming out of a place of, um, of, of not knowing, coming out of a place of, um, of, of, of being suffering or whatever that is, struggle, constraints. Mitzrayim is a, is a metzar, it's something that constrains us. And in order to break free of that, we have to be, like the, the, the paradox is this, this the, the geula, the exile, or the redemption or whatever it is, that, that, that this world is looking for and hopes for is going to be a direct, directly because of the Meitzah, directly because of the, of the constraints. And um, there's a story told about Rabbi Akiva at the time of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And he, and he looks at the temple and he starts to laugh. The Medrash says he starts to laugh and say, why are you laughing? The temple has been destroyed. Uh, you know, our ability to have feel God in our midst is gone. Why, Rabbi Kiva, are you laughing? And he says, I see, you see those foxes over there? You see those foxes over there? That's the prophecy. The prophecy is the foxes are the beginning of the redemption, that there's something to come after the dark comes the light. After the dark comes the light. And uh, our Jewish time is 
predicated on night into day. We, we celebrate Shabbat starting at night time and we come into the daytime. It's night into day. And uh, that, is a, that is a Jewish framework, a frame lens to look at, that it's darkness followed by light. And uh, this for sure is darkness. Um, and uh, the, 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 the hope and the prayer and the faith is that there will be light after the dark, not understanding why there has to be dark or, or, or how long, or not knowing how long this darkness will last, but after the darkness is light, just like the foxes in the, in the temple that were frolicking amongst the rubbles of the temple, that there was, um, there was something, something that was the beginning of the prophecy fulfillment. So I, I, don't, I don't have a prophecy for what will happen, uh, but I do, I do really, really, um, uh, want to point out, as we all know, that Passover is coming, and uh, we're in a very, we're a very dark place. And we came out of Purim. Purim was the hidden miracles of God, and now maybe this is more of a uh, this is this is something that is extraordinary. It's the world being turned upside down, and it happened in the blink of an eye. Something happened really fast. It went from it went from our normal, quote unquote, normal lives to um, this un upside down life very quickly. And uh, as quickly as it can, as it goes down, it can go up. And there's hope there that uh, that please God, it should, it should. And God can do anything, really. Mamash can do anything. So that's 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 one thing. So we continue um, reading in the book of Leviticus. So obviously, um, I'm not going to go over what we've the stories from before. Um, but this book of Yikra, this book of Yikra, Leviticus, is what we started last week. And the word Vayikra we spoke last week is a calling. We all have a calling. Each one of us is here for a reason. Um, there's a teaching about a person's birthday, that the day you were born was the day God said, I need you in the world. You, 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 every single individual one of us need to be in the world. And the day you were born was the day that you needed to be here. And the day you die is the day you don't need to be here, the day that your work in this world is done. And uh, the God, con the, excuse me, the death consciousness that we are all faced with, the, um, the, the, the reality of our mortality, sorry about that, uh, the reality of our mortality is a call to live more fully. I really believe that. I think that when we, uh, when we have an understanding that our time here is limited, that our life is fleeting, that we can use that knowledge, use that maybe even um, fear to live more fully. What am I willing, what do I want to live for? And obviously a lot of the extraneous things that we were engaged in are not, are gone, right? We're not going, we're not, we're not going, doing things that we were used to doing, going to movies and going to sports games and all of these things. We're done. We're done with those. We're not going to the dinner parties and the, and the weddings and the big this and that, that we're not doing those things. And we're coming down to basics. What are the basics? The basics so that I, that I can stay healthy, that my that I that I can say healthy, or that I that I have shelter, or that I have food, or that I obviously the joke is toilet paper. No, I and mean, like we need toilet paper. <laughs> it's not a joke, obviously. But um, the, what what are our, what are we what is the, what are the basics? I one of the one of the things that happened when the Jewish people came out of Egypt, and obviously we're going to talk about these stories next week in the Passover story. But when the Jewish people came out of Egypt. Uh, it is said that it, that part of the uh, part of the redemption happened because of the women, and why were the women? Because when Pharaoh decreed that all the baby boys should be thrown into the rivers and should be killed, it w and the men said, "We're done. We don't want to. We don't want to have relations with our wives. We don't want to bring babies into the world." And it was Miriam, who was Moses's and Aaron's sister, who said to her parent, "Don't do that. Because if you do that, then it's the demise of all the Jewish people, not just the boys." Right. So she. Um, encouraged, she had a prophecy, and she spoke to her parents, and her parents remarried, or they re they came back together, and they gave birth to Moses, and um, and uh, the women would go into the fields, and they would seduce their men, and they would um, they would they were, they were so tired from all the labors, and the women would dress themselves up, and we spoke about how they would uh, use copper mirrors, they had mirrors made out of copper, I guess reflected back, and they would look into the mirrors and pretty themselves such that. Their husbands were aroused by them and would lead to then procreation. And there's a medrash that they gave birth in droves and many, many children. But the idea that the women were the ones that kind of pushed it forward. They were the ones that had the hope. Even in the depths of Egypt, they were having hope that there would be a reason to be born. There'd be reason to live. There's something to live for. Even all the other, all the stuff going on around us, 
there's a gratitude for our lives, for our health. Hopefully, please God, we all stay healthy and we all stay inside our homes. And um, but that that was that was what we did. We had hope. And then when we come out, we go through the sea of reeds and we come <clears throat> and we start singing and dancing. And Miriam leads the song and it's the song of Miriam and she's dancing in circles and they're with their timbrels and their drums. And the question is, where do they get the drums from? And the answer gives Rashi, the medieval commentator says they got the drums. They brought them with them. They had a they had an, a faith. They had they had a, an understanding that God would bring them out, that they would have some joy, that there would be a future where they would need their drums. They would need their drums to sing and rejoice. Even when they were still leaving Mitzrayim, leaving Egypt with the, with, the, with the Egyptians coming after them and the fear and all of that, that they had, they had hope and, they ha and, they, and it wasn't just a hope like, please God, you know, it was like they took their drums with them so they, could, they knew that one day they would rejoice and they had the drums ready. So, you know, I don't know quite how that applies now. So Jewish people come out. We, we spoke about in uh, the book of Exodus, we spoke about the golden calf, a debacle in the episode of the golden calf and how we have the directives to build this Mishkan, to build a tabernacle where God will reside in our midst. There'll be a, there'll be a reunification of the God and the Jewish people and that we will feel the closeness of God in our midst. He will be, there will be a God in the rest, his presence in the tabernacle and in our hearts. We spoke about our hearts. And, uh, and then we have the inauguration of this Mishkan and God's presence rests onto this Mishkan and, uh, and, there's, and there's rejoicing. It's a, it's a happy day. So in, in this book of Vayikra, we're talking about a calling and we're talking about the Kohanim. We're talking about the priestly um, tribe that are descended from Aaron. So Aaron was Moses' brother. And um, he was given the task of being the uh, priest, his family, he and his uh, sons would be the priests in the temple. They would be the ones to whom people would bring their offerings. So when I don't want to use the word sacrifices because it, it conjures up something very um, pagan, perhaps. But uh, from the Jewish sense, there's conversations in the commentators as to whether the offerings were um, secondary or whether they were primary, whether they'll go away, whether they'll come back doesn't matter. The point is that we had um, a history of giving offerings and they were offerings brought for different reasons. So we'd bring something if we did something wrong, if we, if we, uh, if we, if we did something that, you know, um, accidentally we did it wrong, if we did it wrong on purpose. Um, there, were, there were offerings that we would bring, um, they're called sin offerings or guilt offerings, there were thanksgiving offerings, there were peace offerings. Um, there were a lot of different offerings that the people would bring and they would bring, we talked about this last week, they would bring domesticated animals and they would be brought to the temple, they would be given to the priest, they would be, um, uh, the priest would put his hands onto the animal, the animal would somehow on some level represent the person bringing, bringing the offering and then we talked about the rich people and what they would bring and the poorer people what they would bring and the desire isn't what you bring, it isn't what you bring. It's the intention that you bring it with. Is your intention when you bring this offering? What is that intention? And the word for a korban, the word for, for, for an offering in Hebrew, korban, has the root in it to come close. So if I give a gift to somebody I love, or I give a gift to somebody I want to be in relationship with, I give gifts to that person. It's saying, I love you, I love you, I, I want a relationship with you, and I'm giving of myself, so I can give of my time, I can give of my presence, and I can give gifts. And one of the things that, in the time of the Mishkan, and the time of the temple, was that people would bring their first offerings, their fruits, their oxes, their, 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 uh, their turtle doves, etc., different domesticated animals that you would bring. There'll be a lot of blood and there would be a lot of burning up of these offerings on the altars in the Holy Temple. So that's what we're talking about in this week's Torah portion. We're talking about the different kinds of offerings that were brought and, 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 um, and, uh, and how they were brought and what the Kohen did, etc. So that's this week's Torah portion. And the Torah portion is named Tzav which means command. It's a command, like mitzvah. The root of the word mitzvah is, sa is sav, is to be commanded. You are, I'm commanding you, Moshe, to do this, to do this. Tell the Jewish people, this is what they need to do. They need to bring this for this, and this for that, and, and this is what you're going to do. And I'm not going to go through all the details, but there was a detailed 
um, description of what it was that God commanded Moshe to tell the people. So the word tzav is not very commonly used in the Torah. We talk about mitzvahs a lot in our in our daily lives, and like this is a mitzvah, that's a mitzvah, everything's a mitzvah. But the but the commandment is on some level like it makes me think of the executive orders that we're being told to do. Right? It's it's not it's not fickle. It's not put in. It's not or you're not being ordered to stay in your house because you know, the governor wants you to stay in your house. This is like imperative. You need to know this and you need to stay in your house. Moses, you need to know this. This is what you need to know. Like, it, there's something very passionate about this commandment. It's not like, oh, if you feel like it one day, maybe you'd like to clean your room. It's no, clean your room now. It has to be clean now. It's really important to do this now. You have to take this offering and do this and that will absolve you. That will, you know, bring your thanks. That will atone for you, whatever it is, but there's a commandment there, there's a, there's a tzav, there's something imperative and something important that has to be done now, and it, you know, it does line up on some level with these executive orders. So knee-jerk reaction of a commandment, and I know it's for my own, my own humanity, is that when somebody tells me to do something, my knee-jerk reaction is not to do it, like I don't want to be told what to do, I want to figure it out on my own. I, I grew up in England in a very in a very strict um, system. I went to an all-girls, private girls' school, uh, and it was very proper and all that. But we had a lot of laws, and there were a lot of rules, and you couldn't walk down this hallway, and you couldn't do this, and you had to wear these socks in the winter and different socks in the summer, and you had to wear a bow to hat in the there, and there was all, and you had to, a tie had to be a certain way, and, and it felt like, this is ridiculous, these are stupid rules. Why am I following these rules? And I didn't like it, and I felt like I kept pushing against these rules. I don't want rules. I don't want someone telling me what to do. Like, I want to look how I want to look, because I want to look that way, not because somebody's telling me. And so I think, you know, from my understanding that that is human nature. There's a human nature not to be wanted, told what to do, you know. Like if you have teenagers, they certainly don't want to be told what to do. So we have we have um, a sort of like um, an, an innate lack of desire to be told what to do. Like we want to be independent and we want to figure things out on our own and we want to come with our full hearts. Like if you tell me what to do, it's not my full heart. I'm not doing this because I want to. I'm doing it because you're telling me. And on some level, it's a higher. It says in our in our in our Torah understanding of the world that that when we do when we follow a mitzvah when we follow a commandment that God gives us, it's it's a higher level than doing it because we want to. Right. So if we're commanded, like the Kohanim, the priests in this temple in our Mishkan, were you know they had to like take the offerings that the people were bringing, they had to put their hands on them, they had to slaughter them, they had to put them on the altar, big oxes and things, it was a lot of work, it was heavy and there was blood everywhere. I, I don't believe it was a, an easy job for them to have, but they were commanded to do it. And because they were commanded and because they knew it came from God, there was no question that they were going to do it and they did it wholeheartedly and they did it with a passion and they were like really like desirous of what the Korban is doing. What the Korban is doing is bringing you close to God. That's the, the intention. So we spoke before about not just what you're bringing, that's not as important. What's really important and paramount is why you're bringing it. What's your intention for bringing the offering? The intention of bringing the offering is closeness to God. And at the end of the day, <laughs> when we're all like, I don't know, I can't tell you how many people I know who are going to be alone, literally alone for the Seder. And this year it's, it's a, as you probably all know, Wednesday night, Thursday, Friday, two days of Passover outside of Israel, and then Shabbat. So for people who are observant and don't use electronics on Shabbat and Yom Tov, there's three days where they're, they're really isolated. There's no synagogue to go to. There's no friend's houses to go to. There's no one popping in on you. There's no access to television and, and internet. And, and, and. So for those people, being alone is three days of alone. And it's, it's heartbreaking because those are many people I know anyway, were people who would be with other people. They'd be the, with their families or their friends or their communities, etc. So literally, literally, literally going to be alone. And it is really heartbreaking. So... As a as a side, um, in our community, I don't know in wherever you're, wherever you are, but there's there's um, a caterer in town who is making uh, food for Passover, and she's also making a seder plate. And uh, so so um, the organization that I started called Connects Rhode Island um, has now 
we found about 15 people who are going to be alone for the Seder and we're, and we're sending them meals and we're sending them a Seder plate. And I called a few women today to tell them that we wanted to do this. And, um, and, and it, it's like brings you to tears. It really, really brings you to tears. So maybe that, then to say, like, I thought about you and I'm bringing, I'm going to bring food to you and I'm going to bring you a Seder plate. It's like, you're going to bring me a Seder plate? That's so not, you know, like we can do all these things instead of the offerings to God. Like, I want to come close to God. How are we going to get close to God now in this world where we can't go to synagogue and we can't, you know, do all these, like, you know, big mitzvahs, what we can do is we can, we can, I hope this inspires somebody else to do this in their community. You know, I see somebody here from Las Vegas and I see somebody else here from Florida. Like, like maybe there's somebody caterer in your community and find a few like single people who are shut in, like older people or younger people, like whatever, it doesn't matter. People who would like appreciate a meal and a, and a Seder plate. Because they're not going to make a Seder plate, maybe, and, unless they're really committed for themselves. So, And a Haggadah. People don't have Haggadahs. So give them a Haggadah. I don't know. Like, I think instead of the offerings, instead of bringing an ox, which we're not bringing oxes, we're bringing kindness. We're bringing compassion. We're bringing love. We're bringing connection in this in this world where, where we are so interconnected that what the directive coming from the executive orders of our states is stay away from people. Like, yeah, stay away from people, but also come close to people. Like, give to them. Give to each other. Give to the people in your home. Give to the people in your community. When you give, you connect. So it's a different kind of connection than a physical connection, but it's a connection nonetheless. And it's, and it's, and it's above the physical connection. It's almost like a spiritual soul connection. It's like, it's like, it's like you're, you're touching your heart. Your heart's touching another person. So, so when God says to Moses, I'm commanding you with the, with the, with the language of commandment, sav, I'm commanding you, it's, it's, it's an even more powerful directive that has to be done because it's so important that the world will not function if you don't do that. And maybe our sav, our commandment, is instead of obviously the oxes, like I said, is the other things that we can do. And what are the other things we can do instead of, instead of, um, instead of bring our offerings is we can pray. I really believe that's like huge. We have to pray and we have to give thanks. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And, um, wait, I had a whole list of things, which I can't find because I was not prepared, but anyway, anyway, um, a whole, like other things, acts of kindness and calling people and, and paying shiver calls on zoom or whatever we can do. Like keep doing those things. Don't stop doing those things and keep learning Torah keep learning Torah, keep learning wisdom, because it'll connect us to something higher. Like we're in, we're in the trenches. Like we want to, we want to look up. We want to find the foxes. Where are the foxes? Like look into the Torah. The Torah has light aura. There's a light in this Torah and it's going to, it's going to show us some kind of clarity somewhere, sometime it will. So here's something I wrote last year and I'm going to read it because I think that it will um, help to like bring together what the teachings are in this week's Torah portion. So Tzav is to command. And after God, last week we said how this word Vayikra, to call out, that God is calling out to Moses. So we spoke last week about how this calling out to Moses is an intimate God calling. You, Moses, are my mouthpiece. I love you, Moses, in a way that, 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 that other people are not loved because your relationship with me is different. Not that I don't love other people, but there's a more intimate relationship between Moses and God than us and God. So he calls out to God. So Moses, call, God calls out to Moses lovingly. Um, so after God lovingly calls to Moses, there's a command in this week's Pasha, an urgent imperative to bring the offerings to the Mishkan, to the tabernacle, with specific and detailed directions on how and what to bring. One category of kabbanas are of offerings to create a connection. I give to connect were the elevation offerings. It's called the Ola offerings. Brought for bad or wrong thoughts, right? So we, we live in a world of action. Like it doesn't matter what I think, it matters what I do. And Torah is telling us, no, it matters what you think. It really matters what you think. We have control over our thoughts, hopefully. And if not, let's work on that. <laughs> yes, thoughts come and go, but that's a challenge, right? We have to like somehow like, hold like hold on to them and, and 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 control them so let's say let's assume let's try to have control over our thoughts and and when we slip up we bring this Ola offering for th negative Yeah. 
sorry, so, ne so negative thoughts. One category was the elevation offerings brought for bad or wrong thoughts. Sometimes thoughts just come up in our minds, ones which we choose not to act on or to entertain. In response to the presence of these negative thoughts, we bring this offering. It's an Ola offering. The animal brought is completely burnt up on the altar with a fire that burns eternally and perpetually. And in the Torah, it says this fire has to burn night and day, night and day from the dark to the light. It has to keep burning. There's a, a passion that has to keep a flame in us when we're in the darkness and bring it into the light. So when we're in a dark period, there's a imperative that God says to keep that fire burning. The animal, um, this continual fire represents the constancy of our thoughts. It also symbolizes our inner fire that drives us and the fire of Torah. What fires us? What, what, what makes us passionate? What gives us drive? Why do we do what we do? What are we living for? What's our passion? And can we keep ourselves being passionate people all our life? Can we stoke the fire of our, of our, I want to use a different word than passion, but that's what comes up, like the fieriness of our passions. And do, can we control them? Can we direct them? Can we elevate them? And uh, when we slip up, then the, the, the bad thoughts, the negative thoughts that come into our mind necessitate us bringing an animal that's completely burnt up. So there's, a, there's, a, there's the rectification, so to speak, of our negative thoughts coming from some kind of a, of a passion have to be negated, have to be destroyed by a fire, by an outside fire. There's a fire. And it's the same thing. Um, some of you might know that right before Passover, we take all the leftover chametz, we take the bread and the crackers and the things we have in our house that we're not supposed to have in our house, right? We're supposed to get rid of them, we're supposed to sell them, and we're supposed to burn them. We take them and we burn them. They represent arrogance, they represent ego, they represent things that we want to shed, that we want to like get rid of, and, and they come from a certain fiery place within us. And the way to get rid of them is the same way that they arise. So they arise in us from a fiery, passionate place, and they get destroyed literally by fire. So I don't quite know how it's going to work this year because we don't have communal fires where we can take our chametz, we can take our bread and burn it. We happen to have a fireplace in our house, so we'll probably burn, put a, make a fire and burn our chametz there. But I, I think maybe some in some places there you can flush, flush it down the toilet as a second way to do it. But anyway, but the but the uh, the ideal way is to burn our chametz, to burn that which we, the negativity, the ego, the, 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 the thoughts that we have, negative thoughts about other people, negative thoughts about ourselves, um, negative thoughts about the world, I, I don't know, whatever negative thoughts we have, um, don't have to define them, but that we know we have them and we don't want to have them, we want to have positive thoughts, so we're going to try to get rid of them, we're going to try to burn them, we're going to try to not have them, we're going to try to push them away. So the animals um, burnt up, um, and the um, the fire that drives us in the fire of Torah. The Ola offering is powerfully consumed by both this fire and the fire that comes down from above. And it completely ascends up into the higher realms. It's gone. So what's happening is that we put this animal on the altar and the Kohen burns it and the smoke goes up and there's a smoke from God that comes down and it meets. There's a connection between the fire and the smoke that goes up and the and the heavenly presence that comes down and in the temple there was a merging of these of these smokes of these fires of these of the of the uh, of the kind of um of the smoke from the fire that we were bringing up that was meeting the fire that was coming down and maybe there's a metaphor there for us looking up we look up one what is there was the I think he was a congressman, perhaps, of Oklahoma. Maybe he was the governor of Oklahoma. And he was on video speaking about uh, the psalm that speaks about looking up to the heavens. S-I-A-N-I, el Horem, That what, who, where do we look for our help? We look up. We look up at God. We look up into the heaven. You know, there's a, a whole idea of when, um, we spoke about it before, about Moses, when the Jewish people came out of Egypt, and they immediately come through the Reed Sea after that episode. And then they're on the other side and they're now in the desert. And they get attacked from behind by Amalek. 
the evil Amalek who's putting doubt into our into our minds that's that's able on some level able to attack this people that have been brought out literally being like carried on an eagle's wings you know out of Egypt there's the myriad of miracles that happened amazing 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 and then Amalek has the audacity to to attack the Jewish people Moses goes up onto a mountain and when his hands are raised up the Jewish people are able to fight off Amalek his hands are up but he's getting tired so he starts to they start to come down because he's tired holding his hands up and when he start when his hands come down then the Amalekites start to win out and they're beating the uh, the Jewish the Jewish people who are trying to fight off the Amalekites and so there's Aaron stands on one side of him and Hor who is the son of Miriam hold up the arms of Moses and Moses's arms being held up because then the Jewish people look up and they see their salvation comes from God that they win out over the Amalekites and uh, so perhaps you know there's an imagery here in this week's Torah portion of smoke arising going up ascending and the and the smoke of of the divine presence coming down and they're meeting there's a connection and uh, I'm not quite sure what that means for us today but there there's a capacity I think for us to elevate ourselves on some level um, with the, in this time period and to look up, to look for the foxes or to look for the light or to look for the, you know, to the, for the, for the good things, you know, that, that, or the, 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 the role of God in a good way. Um, but knowing that from the, from the darkness comes the light. Okay. So the people were brought, were, were commanded to bring offerings to atone for sins, to express gratitude, to effect peace. A korban, a, uh, the offering, brought with an open heart and with the correct intention would help us achieve closeness to and a deepening of our relationship with God. Another category, category of the offerings were the peace offerings, which included that of the thanksgiving offerings. It brought out, it brought out a, a, excuse me, it is brought out of recognition of the good in our lives. It is an expression of thanks for our life which we don't deserve, which is a gift, brought after being saved from a dangerous, life-threatening life situation. When we recognize everything we have is a gift, we become overwhelmed with gratitude and humility. And the Thanksgiving offering, the Toda offering, help us express those feelings in very real, tangible ways. So let's just take a moment and talk about the Thanksgiving offering. So the Thanksgiving offerings were ones that were brought for four different um, occasions and and now that's sort of like we actually still have these four different reasons so the four different reasons are if you're if you've been in um, incarcerated like uh, people would be incarcerated like Natan Sharansky was in co in co in co uh, incarcerated in Russia in the gulag for being Jewish and and having and doing Jewish things and he was a prisoner of conscience and he was put in solitary confinement in the gulag for eight years it was crazy and he and he was uh, he was brought out he was redeemed from jail and he would have brought a Thanksgiving offering if you're redeemed from jail then you bring a th there was this uh, this terrible story about the Isra Israeli backpacker who was in India and on her way back to Israel she went through Moscow and uh, she had a layover in Moscow and her bag wasn't even going to come into the Moscow airport it literally went from one plane to another and it was taken off by the uh, whoever the the, uh, the Russian KGB or the police or whatever, they took it off and they found a little bit of marijuana in it and they imprisoned her in jail for seven years for drug dealing or, you know, smuggling. And it was, it was crazy. It was so not judge, ju justice and whatever. And it wasn't even, she wasn't even in Russia at all. And her bag wasn't going to be in Russia, but they put her in jail for seven years and the whole thing. And they got her out eventually, like after a few months, but like she would give a Thanksgiving for being redeemed from this jail. Um, a thanksgiving, like, thank God, thank God I, I'm redeemed from jail would be one category. Um, to to when you cross the sea, I guess, you know, maybe it's not such a uh, difficulty to cross seas nowadays, but in the in the day it would be very, very uh, 
you know, worthy of a Thanksgiving offering. If you survived a sea journey, went from one one uh, into the boat and out into the seas and then back again. Yeah, thank God I made it. And uh, if you traversed a desert. So obviously these are things that maybe nowadays don't. Well, maybe they do. I don't know. But these would be reasons. And the fourth reason, which perhaps is more current, is if you survive an illness if you if you come out from a place where you don't think you're going to survive a sickness or an illness and you survive when you've been gravely ill and then you and then you're brought back or then you recover you would give um you would give this offering this toda offering and the offerings that were bought for thanksgiving were ones where you recognized the hand of God in your salvation you recognize that the reason why you survived this illness wasn't because of the medicines that the doctor gave you. It wasn't because of whatever, whatever the reasons you come up with. It was because God helped you recover. It was, it was, a, it was. There was a miracle, even if you got medicine, even if there were surgeons who were operating on you. Like it's the hand of God, because other people could go through the same sickness or could go through the same surgery and die, and you didn't. So there's a recognition. There's a recognition that God's hand was there and that you were saved. You were saved, just like on the birthday we spoke just now, that your birthday was a recognition that you need to be here. There's something for you to do. So I God put you in the world. When you survived an illness, when you survived being in jail, when you survived a sea journey, when you survived a, tra a traversing a desert, there was a recognition that God could have and didn't take your life. And now you're here and you give thanks. And this thanksgiving offering is huge. So today we have a prayer service. The culmination of our prayer service is called the Shemona Esra. It's called the, it's called the um, Amida, the standing prayer. It's one that we say silently, but we speak loud enough that we can hear our own words. We speak out the, uh, the, 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 the prayer, standing, standing, not moving, facing east, facing Jerusalem, where all our prayers go up to heaven, right? They all go to Jerusalem and up. And, um, and we say our prayers, and then we get to this one blessing in not, it's not the only time we bow, but there's a, we bow at the modem prayer. Modem anach nulach. We thank you, God, for our lives, for the miracles, for this and that. Like, I don't deserve anything. I don't, I don't, I don't deserve anything. Like, I'm a speck in the universe. However, I'm alive and you're giving me life and I thank you for my life and I thank you for my skills and I thank you for my Fill in the blank, whatever it is, whatever you can be thankful for. What is it that Brene Brown speaks about? She says, the one key thing that resilient people have is gratitude. So gratitude, obviously as a religious person, gratitude to God. Gratitude to God for everything that you have, everything you have. <laughs> and then if you just even took like a few minutes every day, like grateful for this, grateful for that, like whatever, the like cup of coffee in the morning or the the beautiful flowers that are blooming around here in Rhode Island, beautiful. Um, the sun that was shining today, um, the, the relationships you have, the love you feel, the whatever, you know, fill in the blank. Um, some things don't matter, but some things do. And, and it's okay to be grateful for whatever it is that you're, you're grateful for, but recognize the source. I'm grateful for my strength. I'm grateful for my clarity. I'm grateful for my hearing, my eyesight, my, my legs work, my arms work, whatever, I don't know, you know, but the gratitude as being an important function, I don't know, it has an important psychological and religious, um, you know, um, spin, spin on it. Okay, so let's keep going. So we've got the uh, Thanksgiving offering. Um, the goal of all these kabbalas is greater connection with and closeness to the eternal or powerful or loving or God or good creator. Another way to forge closeness that is available today is to act in godlike ways. The flame that is constantly burning inside us, which it says is the, our soul is the flame of God, right? So that flame, we're back to fire, that is constantly burning inside us can be channeled as a force for good. Being godlike is to give and to love, to use our character traits in good ways, to visit the sick, maybe we can't do that today, but we can call people, 
to clothe the naked, to make sure that people have clothing, to feed the hungry, make sure people have food, make sure that, that the food banks are full, make sure we make our donations, make sure, you know, people have food for Passover, make sure people have the, a Seder plate, make, you know, escort and bury the dead. I'm not sure that what we're doing on that front, um, given today the uh, fear of COVID-19 and people who may die of it, like what we're doing, we could talk about that another time. But these are these are the things that, God does, and therefore when we emulate God, when we are God-like, we are God-like, we become like God, we become like Moses, we become somebody who represents God in this world. We're the messenger for goodness and love and giving in this world. That's a Jewish teaching, and that's what we can still keep doing, each one of us, you know. Um, yeah, so love is the bottom line and the bedrock of creation. God loves us, we love him, and we work to love each other Love born naturally from gratitude and humility. So let's go back to the Kohen. The first thing the Kohen, let me read it right out of the Torah. So God says to, God spoke to Moses saying, command Aaron and his son saying, so Aaron's our priest. This is the law of the elevation offering. This is the Ola. It's an elevation offering that stays on the flame on the altar all night until the morning, all through the darkness until we get to the clarity, all through the straits, all through the... Egypt, all through the struggle, all through the thorn bush that we're entangled in right now until the morning. It's not going to stay like this forever. There will be a morning, just like when the temple was destroyed. We didn't know there would be an end, just like people in the Holocaust didn't know there would be an end. But there, there is an end. We have to have hope in the end. I think one of the things that religion can give us is hope that there's that there's there's, there's something go big going on and there's something at the end of this tunnel that's good. And the fire in the altar should be kept aflame on it all the time. Keep the fire burning. Keep the passion going. Keep it going. Keep it going. Don't let it go out. Don't give up. Keep moving. Keep going. Keep doing whatever you need to do. Meditating, eating well, sleeping well, staying at home, <laughs> saving lives by staying at home. Actually, you know, if you know, the, the importance of the life in Jewish teaching is is the, the, the almost beyond anything else. Like that you do, ev you break every commandment in the Torah pretty much to save lives and when we stay home we're actually saving lives we're saving lives by staying home we don't even know we're saving lives by staying home but we are so how what how amazing it is to think about it from a, par a, a, a paradigm shift the shift is you're not staying home I wish I could go out it's like I'm staying home and when I stay home I'm saving lives I actually don't know how many lives or which lives but I am and and that's an amazing thing that I can do it's like almost like what can I do you can stay home and save lives like you are literally saving lives by staying home so that is a doing even though it doesn't feel like a doing because you're not quote doing anything but you are doing something you're saving lives by staying home and that's huge that's the highest mitzvah is to save lives so here's what, so we keep this flame going. The Kohen shall put on his fitted linen tunic and he shall put on his linen breeches on his flesh and he shall separate the ash of what the fire consumed of the elevation offering on the altar and place it next to the altar. He shall, so what's he doing? He's taking out the garbage. He's taking out the ash that has burned all night. He's gonna, so Aaron in his fancy clothes is literally taking out the garbage he's taking out the ash that has burnt up overnight and if you go back to the teaching we learned earlier which is that the offering here is bought for impure thoughts thoughts that shouldn't have and what do we do we burn them up and then when we burn them up they're gone and then we take them out and we throw them up next to the altar because we've elevated them we've 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 um we've um we've transformed them into something different they're no longer they're no longer you know that they're, they're no longer hopefully in our minds like we we there's something physical about about discarding it in a physical way to represent what we're doing on a spiritual plane so we're getting rid of that of that dirt that stus we're getting rid of it we're burning it we're throwing it out so there's a physical way of of, of dismissing something that represents something spiritual that we're doing and then what does he do? He changes his garments. He will remove his garments and don other garments. And he shall remove the ash, the out of the camp to a pure place. The fire on the burn, on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be extinguished. The ne'er tamid, the, the, the light that burns continually in the, in the, in the synagogues, they 
burning all the time, representing God's presence all the time, representing our passion all the time. Our soul is the fire. Our, fi our, our soul is the candle of God. And the Kohen shall kindle wood upon it every morning. He shall prepare the elevation offering upon it and shall cause the fat of the peace offering to go up in smoke upon it. And the permanent fire shall re remain a flame on the altar. It shall not be extinguished. So we have this fire burning and we have the Cohen, Cohen changing his clothes. He goes from one set of clothes to another set of clothes. And, the, and we do that. We do that. That We do that. We do that. We wear... Okay, so this is like into the spiritual, this is into the Kabbalistic understanding of, of our clothes. What clothes our soul? Our soul is a breath of God. Our soul is the candle of God, so to speak. And our soul is only able to exist in this world because it has a garment that holds it. And the garment is our body. Our body can, can, um, creates a, a vessel for the soul to exist in this world. It holds it into this world. That's what our body is. It's a, a garment, a clothing for the soul. So when we die, us, our garment is shed and our soul is released up into the higher realms and it, and it continues on its journey, right? So it goes through this world and it continues on. So the Kohen, um, and by the way, what we do as a Chavah Kedisha, what we do when we prepare people for burial is we, Jewish people, we take the person in our care, women wash women to prepare women, men prepare men, and we take the woman in our care, we take off her clothes and we put and we put linen shrouds on her and the linen shrouds are the same garments that the Kohen, that the priest wore in the temple. So we're, we're, we're changing her clothes as she transitions to a new being, a new reality. So too, we change our clothes. We're changing our clothes all the time. You know, what, what, what clothing are we wearing and why are we wearing it and what does it represent? And I think that the, the lesson that we can learn here from the Cohen changing his clothes is to recognize that at the end of our existence, back to the don't deny death teaching, don't deny death. We're going to change our clothes. One day your clothes will be taken off you, the ones you put on or the hospital put on you or whatever, and we'll be put into tachrich and hopefully into shrouds. And that will be the clothing that we, we have for the rest of our life's journey or, or our next life journey. We're going to change our clothes. Okay, so in um, so the flame, uh, the signal, in temple times we had the korbanas, we had the offerings to wipe our slate clean. We had sin offerings and guilt offerings to renew us and to help us return to the straight path. Today, in addition to trying to emulate God, we also have prayer, Torah study, um, charity, uh, hospitality, maybe that's a little harder right now, Acts of kindness mixed with compassion, kindness, acceptance, and love to help us achieve the closeness with God that we desire. Love is the bottom line and the bedrock of creation. God loves us, we love him, and we work to love each other. Love born naturally from gratitude and humility. Thank you, God, for my life and all that I have. In our standard prayers, so this is the mode in prayer that I mentioned, when we bow, and, and by the way, when that prayer is repeated by the chazan, by the leader of the service, when he repeats those, that Shemona Esrei, that Amida, that standing prayer that we all said quietly to ourselves and we said it, we said it, you know, in our own bubble of hopefully our own thoughts, whatever. And then we stand there and we listen to the Chazan, the Torah, the person leading the service. He repeats the whole thing over again and we get to the mode in prayer, but he stops and we say our own mode in. He can't say a thanksgiving prayer for us. I can't say a thanksgiving prayer for you and you can't say a thanksgiving prayer from us because thanksgiving has to come from us. It has to be us thanking, thanking God, thanking, recognizing what it is that I'm grateful for. You can't say it for me because you don't know what I'm grateful for. And, I'm, and I, you can't represent me because I have to represent myself in my expression of gratitude. It has to come from me. It's an admission that I can't do this alone. It's an admission. Gratitude is an admission that I can't do this alone. I needed you. I needed you and I need God and I need each other. And we all need each other. We all need each other. And we know that. We really know that. Um, that we need each other. And that admission then hopefully could lead to this sense of uh, like overwhelming almost gratitude. 
So this is the prayer that we say in the standard prayer. It says, we thank you, God, and tell of your praises regarding our lives, which are in your hands. Our lives are in your, your God, God's hands. Regarding our souls, which are entrusted, which are entrusted to you. Regarding our, your miracles, which are with us every day. And regarding your wonders and favors, which are with us every moment, evening, morning and noon. You are good, for your compassion is never ending. You are compassionate, for your kindnesses never cease. Our hope has always been in you. For all these things we bless and exalt your name, constantly and forever. All living things will acknowledge and thank you. And they will praise your name in truth, God who saves and helps us. Blessed are you, God. Your essence is goodness and it's a pleasure to give thanks to you. So that's um, that's the mode in prayer that we say um, in three times a day, actually. OK, so did I say everything I wanted to say? I don't know. Did I talk for an hour? I have no idea. <laughs> um, oh, so one more thing about the Thanksgiving prayer. That the Thanksgiving prayer um, is said. Um, um, I think I'm hoping it's a Thanksgiving prayer. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think it's the Thanksgiving prayer that is said um, that has to be eaten. Hmm. Hmm. I'm not. I'm not sure. I have to get back to which which one. Because not all the offerings were eaten. Like the Ola offering that we just spoke about for the imp in negative thoughts, that was completely burnt up. So nobody ate that. But there was an eating of some of the some of the some of the offerings were eaten. Some of them were burnt. Some of them were eaten. Um, but they had to be eaten in a holy place. And it says that in the Torah. It has to be eaten in a holy place. So where's the holy place? So you could say, oh, it was in the, it was in the temple. Oh, it was in the tabernacle. That's where the holy place is. Because that was a holy meaning separate. It was something, it was a different place. It was an elevated place. It was a spiritual place. But there, some of the commentators say, no, no, no. The holy place is, it has to be eaten in a holy mouth. Your mouth has to be holy. What does that mean? It means that what goes into your mouth and what comes out of your mouth has to be holy. So again, like, if our thoughts um, are, are are the world we create, what's the story we tell ourselves? Back to Rene Brown. Our story that we tell ourselves reflects what we say. And if we say good things, if we build each other up instead of pushing each other down, that we elevate and we create holiness, our mouth becomes holy. If we eat kosher food, if we eat matzah on Seder night and we speak of the coming out of Egypt, our mouths become holy. They are holy, and then we can eat from the offerings because they that we've elevated. Everything's elevated. Everything's taken up a notch. Everything's going up into a higher realm. So we can go down or we can go up, <laughs> and it's our choice. And we can go up or down in our minds, in our thoughts, and the story we tell ourselves. You know, that's that's where it is. So, so I think some of the things. I don't even know what time it is, and I don't know how long I've been talking. And I don't have a watch, and I'm feeling like completely. <laughs> adrift but uh, maybe maybe I'll just wrap it up here so so the idea of korbanas the idea of the offerings the offerings are um, our attempt to come close to God our attempt to give something in the act of giving we become close like those of us who are blessed to be parents um, we give a lot to our children and perhaps we give them to them more than we give to anybody else in the whole world and we love them so much <laughs> And so we keep giving, and the more we give, the more we love, right? So there's that, that teaching that the word um, hava in Hebrew is, is the root of the word love is to give. So to those people that we love, we give to them. So if we want to create a relationship with God that's a loving relationship, we have to give. We have to give. Well, we can give God. God doesn't need anything. So we give anyway. <laughs> we give because we need to give. I need to give. So, you know, now we're not giving offerings. We're not giving any animals or, or, or frankincense and myrrh and, 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 and meal offerings. We're not giving those things. What are we giving? We're giving us, our whole our hearts. We're giving our prayers. We're giving our acts. We're giving our intentions. Uh, we're giving our thoughts. We're giving who we are. Like, I want to be connected to God because God is the source of everything. God is eternal. God is good. And if I want to live a higher life, I have to connect myself there. And maybe it is also about connecting to other people because there's holiness in other people. We're created in the image of God. So yes, it's about horizontal relationships, but it's also about a vertical relationship. And 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 going coming to Seder night. Seder night is about about us in in the in the in the string of history, in the chain of history where we're here right now. But like look back, you know, read the stories of the 
Seder nights that happened in the Holocaust or happened during the Spanish Inquisition or blah, 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 blah. Who would have thought we would be l having Seders where we're, we're, we're locked in our homes with whoever's in our house and nobody can come in and we're not having grandma from Pennsylvania and we're not having great aunt there and we're not having our single friend who lives down the block. We're not having anybody, those people in the house and those, and that's what we're doing just like it was for other people in other times. So we have a sense of vertical, vertical um, history and what we want to put into the world for the future and where it's going to go in the future and it says if you leading a seder on your own if you're a person who has to say who is um who is saying a seder on their own you don't think it you say it you have to ask the four questions out loud and you have to like like eat the matzah and the mora and, like even if you're on your own and and many people are on their own this year and and maybe more than ever but do it just do it you know like it's going to bring spiritual energy into the world it's going to elevate the whole world so that's one thing is that there's a vertical the vertical history of who we are and where we are in that chain of 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 uh, of tradition and then we have like horizontal chain of tr of like how we're going to like people like I can't do that because I observe not um being on the internet but people are going to have zoom seders and then they're going to connect that like that or whatever or they're going to send messages to their loved ones like we're with you or send teachings or send seder plates <laughs> we can all send a seder plate to somebody let's do it let's let's have a mass sending of seder plates to whoever doesn't have a seder plate let's get them out there to those people who are shut in who don't know how to make a seder plate or aren't going to be bothered we could do it and we could say i love you here's a seder plate <laughs> Um, anyway, that's, uh, so, um, um, so the Korban, the Korban, the idea of an offering, the, the idea of instead of it being, um, it's going to be compassion and love and kindness and prayer and, and, and shout, shout to God, like, what are you doing to us? Like, stop this. We need, we need, we need to have recovery. We need to have, we need to have livelihood. We need, we need, we need, we need to be able to exist. We need to, we, we, we've got to learn the lessons really quickly so we can get on the other side of this. We have to like storm the heavens to be on the other side and recognize that there's a hand of God in all of this. It's not just the wet markets in Wuhan and it happened to be that this happened and this happened, and this happened, and here we are. No, I think there's, there's, there's a bigger picture. Yes, that might be the mechanism, but behind that is okay, world, you need to wake up, there's a reset button, and the reset button's being set, and maybe there's foxes somewhere, I haven't seen them yet, and maybe there's light at the end of the tunnel, I haven't seen it yet, we still feel like we're in the dark, we still feel like we're in an Egypt, but even when we were in Egypt, and even when we were coming out, what did Miriam bring? She brought women, and they all brought their drums, because they knew that one day there would be drum playing. What are we bringing with us? I don't know the answer to this question, but what are we, how do we see it, and how do we find the silver linings and how do we stay afloat and what do, what are the thoughts that we put in our minds and can we stop with the shtus and all the negativity and and like focus on what's really important and and god's giving us gift of saying yes stay in your homes focus on what's important that you know you are important you're on your own you're important you have every um capacity please god you you can see and you can read to have a seder and find matzah you know if you can't find matzah find somebody who can find you matzah like eat matzah and eat moro and say something about the seder and you've done it you've done it you don't have to like there's a lot of stuff that's extra that's the core of it matzah moro and the story it's what we have to do and give thanks and have gratitude and be humble <laughs> and have a positive attitude and love all people <laughs> and uh look for closeness and um i think that's pretty much what i want to say the last thing is that through all of these offerings that are being described in this week's Torah portion, the Torah portion says tzav, command, I'm commanding you to bring these offerings. And maybe God's saying, I'm commanding you to be kind. I'm commanding you to love. I'm commanding you to shout out and cry out to me. When the Jewish people were in Egypt, they had to cry out to God. They had to connect. They had to say, I recognize God. You are the source of my salvation. S-I-N-I. I look up to you, God, who is the source of salvation. Yes, we can look for the vaccines and enough, but at the end of the day, I truly believe that the only reason that we'll have a vaccine is because God wills it. Yes, we can put all our man intellect into it, but it will only be successful if God wills it to be successful. And so, and so I think it's a lot about our opportunity at on this 
Shabbos Haggadah. We're coming up to a Shabbos called the Great Shabbos. What happened on the first Shabbos Haggadah? This coming Shabbos was the Shabbos, was the day where the Jewish people were told by God, they were commanded by God to bring the lamb, to bring the sheep of the Egyptians. It was Egyptian God, the God of the Egyptians. Bring it into your homes, Jewish people. Take it away from those Egyptians and tie it to your bedpost. And in four days time, you're going to slaughter it and you're going to eat it. Because that's the night of redemption. That's the blink of an eye. You're going to go from slavery to freedom in a blink of an eye. And your matzo won't have time to rise. It's not about your ego. It's not about you. Yes, it is about you. It's not about your ego. It's not about you. It's about me bringing you out. Because I, want, I God, want a relationship with you. I want closeness with you, Jewish people. And that's so much of a parallel of what we're going through right now. We're shut in our homes you know, we, we, okay, we're not bringing in the, the lamb, but we had to go against the norms of the society that the Jewish people were living in when they were enslaved in Mitzrayim and the, and the Egyptians were worshipping the lamb. We took the lamb and we tied it to our doorposts. Like, what kind of God is that? Like, how do we have the courage to do that? We had the courage because God commanded us and God had just bought 10 plagues. So we, you know, we got it. We, got, we understand that God's in control. We understood it and we took that lamb and we took it into our homes and it stood there for four days defying the social norms of the Egyptians. And we, we elevated ourselves by doing that. We did what God commanded and it was a great thing. It was a, it was a Shabbos Hagadon. It was a great Shabbos that day where they took the sheep and they brought it into their homes. I don't know quite what that means for us today. I really don't. This Shabbos is Shabbos Haggadol. I don't know what it means to, on some level, slaughter, you know, the gods of our secular society. I don't know what that means. I don't know if it, if it means that. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm just telling you what I'm learning and what I see and what I hear. So, and we're going to eat our, we're going to eat our offerings, those offerings that are not completely burnt up. We're going to eat them with holy, from, in a holy place. We're going to eat them with a holy mouth that speaks holy words and that eats holy food and that, and that creates a story that we can live with and that we want, that we have hope. And, um, please God, the, um, the Magefa, the plague that is plaguing our world will, Please God be gone in the blink of an eye. I wish you a good night.